I'm grateful to be be with you. And um, my goal, ultimately, with this session is a lot of times we are so busy defending the truth that often we never get to the heart of the message, to the gospel itself. And I think there's something that's overpowering in the message itself that is its own great apologetic. But before I get there, I want to give some background. And, and probably that'll take up uh, two-thirds of our time together. All of you in this apologetics network are already well familiar with the fact that um, apologetics simply means defense in the Greek. We see it used in classical literature in Plato's Apology and his defense in Athens. We see it used in the early church by Justin Martyr in his Apology 1 and 2. Uh, as they make defense for Christianity, the errors that were afloat in Rome, and, and Justin writes to the, to the emperor saying, we, you know, we've been accused of things that aren't so. We've been accused uh, because of our um, love feasts, of being um, um, people given to uh, orgies. We've been accused because we drink the uh, blood of Christ and eat the body of Christ, of cannibalism. and. He's just trying to take these errors that were afloat and, and give the truth to the emperor. And, and, and though it is good to be familiar with basic types of apologetic appeals, and we'll talk about some of those, it is best not to neglect the most profound apologetic inherent in the gospel itself. That's where I want to go. Um, but as we defined uh, uh, apologetics as just defense, um, there are classical examples, and we can learn from those classical examples some significant things. So you go back to uh, Plato's Apology, you go to uh, the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, where they're trying to figure out do you have to be circumcised or not to become a Christian, um, and uh, Paul's Apology even in Mars Hill in Acts 17. And, and I, I want to say that we can even draw from these an epistemology that will warn us of why we need to be centered on the message of the gospel because of some things that are broken and falling apart in our own hearts. So let me unpackage this. When uh, Socrates makes his defense before the court of Athens, I know you're all familiar with his apology. He's accused of being an atheist and he's accused of misleading the youth of Athens. And he begins his defense by saying, how can you believe in horsemanship and not believe in horses? How can you believe in divine things and not believe in divinities? And he tells a story of an acquaintance of his named Cherophon who had returned from the oracle at Delphi and had said to him that the oracle at Delphi, the Pythian prophetess, had said Socrates was the wisest man in the world. Consequently, he's not dismissive of that. Uh, sometimes people would say, oh, you Christians, what, what are you talking about? You believe God's revealed something to you, and they're very dismissive. How can you Christians say Jesus is the only way even? How many of you have run across that one? In John uh, 14, 6, and they think that we're so narrow. And I like to say, well, tell me your understanding of truth if you're going to be dismissive of that claim because it's narrow. All truth claims are narrow, right? This is a pen, true or false. Well, i got to open it up, right? It could be a laser pointer. No, it's actually a pen. Um, this is a pen, true or false. The truth statement, uh, truth is not reality. Truth is what I claim about reality when I speak accurately about it. There has to be something to support the claim. All truth statements are narrow. I hold the truth in an open hand because truth is complex. This is a pen, that's true, but what kind of a pen? We could talk about the maker, it's a fountain pen. We could talk about its length, its width, its molecular structure. We could talk about the compound of the ink, and so on, how the volume of ink it holds, how it writes on paper, how it writes on cardboard, how it writes on paper smeared with butter, not very well. We could go on and on and on about this. Any truth that I know can still be plumbed more deeply, applied more widely, and seen in some sort of coherent relation with other truths. And, 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 and it has applications to questions I maybe haven't even thought to answer yet or ask yet. And, and so if a person says to me, oh, how can you Christians assert that Jesus is the only way? It's so narrow. I can say back to them, Jesus' claim may or may not be true, but it can't be false because it's narrow. All truth claims are narrow. And all truth claims, even if we go deeper with them and wider with them, have to have some 
object to which they are referring in order to validate the truth claim, and that which is assert, asserted by a false statement doesn't exist. False statements exist, but that which is asserted by the false statement does not exist. That's why we can falsify the claim. So anyway, with this in mind, Socrates is not in any way dismissive of the claim that he's the wisest man in the world. He says it's an objective claim. And even scripture, revealed truth, is an objective claim. We can look at it, we can deal with it, we can think about it propositionally, we can think about it inferentially, and we can begin to make uh, further claims and applications about it. And Socrates is well aware of that, when people are dismissive even of our supernatural claims. I say, well, you know, there's a rich history where these things have been discussed before, then let's look at this history. And if you're going to reject Christianity, you're going to be rejecting a lot of Western civilization, or at least Western thought, that's been built on this kind of approach to think about these. And Socrates was not so narrow-minded and not so subjective. He says it's either true or false. So you know what he did. He engaged in conversations with people who claimed to have uh, certain knowledge about things. So here's Euthyphro. He says he understands justice. Socrates is on his way to the court of Athens, and he's on trial, and he meets Euthyphro, his friend. He says, Euthyphro, you're heading to the court. Where, what are you going for? He says, I'm going to accuse my father of impiety or injustice. Socrates says, you're going to accuse him of impiety or injustice? Wow, to make such an accusation, you must know what justice is. He says, oh yeah, I have certain understanding about that. Well, what did your father do? Well, my father had a slave, and he murdered another slave. So he put the murderer in a pit and sent a third slave to the magistrates to find out what, she, what he should do with the murderer. And while the slave was in the pit, he died. And that was an act of injustice. And Socrates says to Euthyphro, well, Euthyphro, um, could you instruct me in justice? I want to learn about that stuff. And Euthyphro says, Socrates, they say you're a wise man. You must be wise because you select very good teachers for yourself. And it's just full of arrogance, like all the dialogues of Socrates, there's a great humor in it and so on, or the works written by Plato and stuff. And so he asks him to define justice, piety. And he says, well, piety and justice is when you have a father who had a slave who murdered another slave and he put him in the pit. And basically, it's totally self-referential, totally utilitarian, totally subjective. And Socrates says, well, let me ask you this question, Euthyphro. Could there ever be instances of justice that extend beyond a father who puts a slave in a pit and, uh, and, and so on? Well, yeah. Well, then you haven't given me a robust enough definition. And throughout the dialogue, he gives multiple numbers of definitions, and Socrates finds flaws in each one. And the consequence of all these flaws are that Socrates is able to say, well, maybe the Pythian prophetess, the Oracle of Delphi, is right. Because you say you know and I find contradiction, and I know you don't. I know I don't know, so I have the truer knowledge. And then he goes on and engages Io, and you know the rhapsody, and he engages the statesman, and he engages Theotetus, and he engages Catalyst, and all these other people, Cratylus, and, and, and he finds this same kind of thing going on, and his mission was to find out, was the oracle right or wrong? What's he doing then? Well, his epistemology, right, the science of knowledge, how you know, can you know, do you know, how do you know, and how do you know you know? And he comes with a confirming approach to these things with authority. Here's revelation, an objective statement. Reason engages in argument. And the collection of experience that seem to indicate that maybe he's right. Now, the way he's going about it, he's not going to be able to settle ultimately the question because he'd have to interview everybody in the world. You know, I... I, I say to my students, can I say Prague is the most beautiful city in the world? And they say, no. And I say, why? They say, because you haven't been to every city in the world. I say, okay, that's fair-minded. Can I say Prague is the most beautiful city I've ever seen? Now, Gdansk last summer, that was close. <laughs> Gdansk is beautiful. But, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful city, but, but I, I, if they say, if I say Prague's the most beautiful city I've seen, they can say, well, what cities have you seen? And if I say, well, I've seen Barstow, California, which is, uh, you know, not a pleasant place, they can say, well, your statement, Prague's the most beautiful, and those are the only two cities you've seen, it's not a significant statement. But if I start saying some of the places where I've been, Quebec City, Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, Salzburg, um, 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 
Budapest, and so on, Vienna. And I start mentioning these places, and now I say, of all of them, as beautiful as they were, Prague was the most beautiful. They still can ask me another question. What's your definition of beauty, and how do you apply it to a city? And if I can't give that, again, my, 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 my statement that I can make has to be reduced to, I like Prague. I like Prague. So, so I need to be recognizing that here is Socrates, and he's got authority, reason, and experience. And he brings these things together for a reason. Why do we need the checks and balances on our thinking of these things? I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's go to Acts 15. So Paul has been out preaching with Barnabas, and there's a lot of people who have taken issue with the fact that the Gentiles have come to faith, and it's over the issue of circumcision. Circumcision, I think, for Christians is the elephant in the, in the room. You read scripture in a church service, and circumcision will be in the text. It's, it appears so often in the Bible, we never talk about it. Do any of you, am I the only one that thinks that's weird? I actually preached a sermon on circumcision once, and was never invited back to that church again. <laughs> so here's, here's God speaking to Abraham. All right, Abraham, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make you a great nation. Your name, Abram, exalted father. I'm going to change to Abraham, father of nations. I'm going to give you many descendants, and I'm also going to give you this land. And one of your descendants is going to come along and is going to be a source of blessing to the whole world. So it's a glorious passage, especially Acts 15, I mean, excuse me, Genesis 15, when, when Abraham says, well, you know, when? Well, you know, your descendants will go down into Egypt and they'll be there for about 500 years because the cup of the Amorites not yet full. And... Um, the people in Canaan are doing egregious things, but I'm still handing out grace to them. I'm going to give them a long period of time where I'll let them come to me. But nevertheless, your descendants will be in Egypt, and after 500 years they'll come, and they'll be a great nation in 500 years, and you'll get the land in 500 years. And oh yeah, as far as that descendant, it'll be a source of blessing in the whole, whole world, 2,000 years. You'll have to wait before that happens. And he says, well, what do you give me? Oh, Abraham, your reward will be very great. I will be a shield to you. I give you myself. I give you the greatest gift I can give you. That'll be important at the end of this time. So Abraham is then told by God, here's your half of the bargain. You have to take all the little boys that are born to you, and on the eighth day after their birth, you have to take the most intimate part of their anatomy and remove the foreskin from it. Am I the only one that thinks that's odd stuff? And I wonder why on earth, and it just reverberates throughout Scripture. Why does God put that in there? Matter of fact, it's so significant that before Moses is finished with the Pentateuch in Deuteronomy, he's using an analogy for the depth of spiritual life. And if we don't refer to the real thing, we probably miss out on the analogy and how glorious it is. But I think it's this. I think God says, okay, here's a scar. And every procreative act of Israel, as your children and descendants are multiplying, and every procreative fact, uh, act, in that intimate moment, you will have a reminder that my promises are going to come true. And then at the end of Deuteronomy, he's saying, circumcise your hearts. Take the most intimate part of your life and remove all pretense, even the thinnest veneer of pretense, and circumcise your heart and be honest before me, honest before me. Because we as fallen creatures are prone to rationalization, self-justifications, and we need to be reminded that God wants something from us different. An awareness of his deep, deep love, which means that we can be thoroughly honest before him, acknowledging our failures and fallenness, so hungry and recipient of his forgiveness and grace, and so on. So, Paul and Barnabas have been out preaching. All kinds of Gentiles have come to faith. People who are uh, believers, it says in the text, but are of the party of the Pharisees. They're not happy about the fact that Gentiles have come to faith. And they say, if Gentiles come to faith, they have to be circumcised first. And Paul's thinking that the grace of the gospel is being challenged at this point, And they have a council. 
And what do they do at the council? Peter gets up first and says, I had this vision. I was deployed to Cornelius' house. These Gentiles came to faith. They were filled with the Spirit. There was confirming evidence that God was in this work. I had this experience. Paul and Barnabas share their experience. There's experience. James takes them to the Scripture, and they start looking in the Scripture and say, here are passages that totally missed our perspective because we didn't bring to it an understanding. We brought to it assumptions that blinded us. And so they go back to the Scriptures, and they see at the dedication of the temple, Solomon's talking about the Gentiles and the whole world coming to faith. And all of a sudden, they have now authority that validates some of these claims. So they've shared their experience, they have authority, James gets up and he ties it together reasonably. Authority, reason, and experience. C.S. Lewis in The Discarded Image, where he talks about the medieval worldview, says of the medieval worldview, just like the classical and biblical worldview, says that the medievalists understood that truth claims needed the check and balance of authority, reason, and experience. And he uses that in several of his essays as well. Why I'm not a pacifist. He talks about the authority, reason, experience as he employs his argument. He uses it in Christian Reflections and a couple of the arguments there as well. We see when Descartes has his problem and emphasizes reason apart from experience and authority, and we see the reaction of Locke when he says, oh no, it's experience, and these things get severed from one another, uh, the truth claims become muted at some level. So consequently, we look at these apologies and so on, and we see evidence of it too in Paul's um, uh, uh, defense at Mars Hill. What can be learned through epistemology, uh, inherent in these examples, the authority, reason, experience feature, and I would like to say this becomes important to us, this check and balance, and it will lead us to, again, this apologetic that's rooted in the gospel itself that's so compelling. And that is, we need a check and balance because we're fallen people. Now, since the fall, we've had a proclivity towards self-referentialism, towards forgetting the transcendent things that impinge upon us. And basically, like a spider spinning out its web, we spin out what we think is truth from our own experience without any respect of the larger world and other features. George MacDonald, an author who influenced Lewis. Anybody in here from Scotland? We've seen a lot of Scotsmen here. Okay, well, George MacDonald, the great Scottish writer, in his novel, Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, made this claim, we do not have souls. We are souls. We have bodies. If you say to a child, he has a soul, he thinks like anything else he has, his coat, his keys, his books, he can misplace them. He thinks when he dies, he goes to the grave and his soul goes off someplace else. But tell a child he is a soul and he has a body when he goes to heaven. He has a body, he's not a Gnostic, but when he goes to heaven, he goes off to heaven and he leaves his body behind in the grave like clipped hair on a barbershop floor after you had a haircut for those of you that still need them. <laughs> so you think about it, so what, what makes up the soul? And you know, it, there's a lot of ways to look at this. I think I could set forth proofs for the existence of the soul, but. Generally, we would say the soul, that immaterial part of what it means to be human, has a volitional part, choosing, the will, has a thinking part, the reason, and has a feeling part, the emotion. I want to suggest to you, even coming from an academic environment, the reason is by far the weakest. And the reason why the reason is weak is because, let's say I make a bad choice, a bad moral choice. My reason doesn't speak to my will and say, boy, Jerry, that was really stupid. You continue down that line and all you're going to do is hurt yourself and hurt other people who are looking to you. No, my reason being weak is marshaled by my will to make all kinds of excuses and rationalizations for that bad choice. Um, what Aristotle called acrasia or acrasia, this rationalizing of bad behavior. C.S. Lewis wrote in a in uh, the preface to Paradise Lost, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Aristotle in the Ethics said, we suppress truth in our unrighteousness. G.K. Chesterton said, uh, vice demands a sort of virginity, as it rationalizes its bad behavior. Well, if I am talking to a person who has this rationalized bad behavior, and I can use all the arguments in the world, 
But if their position is a position that's just masking or covering up with pretense some sin and some behavior, I'm probably not going to get through by virtue of argument. I need something else, something that I would suggest to you is embedded in the gospel itself. If my, if my emotion, if I'm hurt and wounded because somebody does something to me that's offensive and I become bitter towards that, um, Anne Lamont says that in her book, Traveling Mercies, bitterness is like you drinking the rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. Staying tethered to those events. Years after the fact, the person may have left my life, but I'm still living in reaction. You know, the person you're talking to about Jesus and doesn't want anything about it because they had a father or a mother who was abusive at home and claimed to be a Christian or something like that. Or you'll see it sometimes in the, in the silly rationalizations of, I don't want anything to do with Christianity after all. Look at the Spanish Inquisition or the Crusades or something like that. And they're tethered to some historical event. We need to give answers for those things. But usually it could be masking some woundedness. And the reason being weak doesn't say to that person, you need to grieve what happened. You need to press out the pus of it and forgive that person so you can untether from those events and be free to look at life as it is, not life as you're projecting on it. No, my reason being weak keeps encapsulated as a cyst on my soul, that body of pus. You bump up against me, I'll bleed a little in your direction. The apologists could speak till they're blue in the face of all these glorious arguments they have, but if you haven't lanced the cyst on the soul, you're not going to get very far. There's something embedded in the gospel itself that can help us with that. Matter of fact, C.S. Lewis says, Reason stands as dragon sentries before the heart. And how do you get past the watchful dragons? Especially when that reason is so full of excuses and rationalizations or acrasia. That, that rationalization that leads to moral blindness. Talk about sin? They don't have a sense that they're sinful because they've rationalized their behavior. Lewis says sometimes story gets past watchful dragons. Um, he, he says this to people, if we've read the Bible, we understand that, because David had committed adultery and murder, and Nathaniel is given the responsibility, or Nathan is given the responsibility to go tell him, David, that he sinned. I don't know about you, I wouldn't have liked that responsibility. He's already sinned egregiously, and he's already killed somebody who, uh, in an attempt to cover up, and now I've got to go tell him? And how's Nathan going to accomplish the task? He tells a story. And the story gets past the watchful dragon, and David hears. Jesus uses parable, he uses story. And there's no story that affects us more deeply than the gospel story. That story itself. I'm, I'm always amazed how... This story often, too, is embedded even in the movies we see and the books we read. You read Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, and, and we see Charles Darnier and Sidney Carton, and Sidney Carton, at the end of that book, does a very Christ-like thing, saving the life of Charles Darnier and giving his life up for him, and it moves us deeply. Um, James Cameron, he's an interesting guy. Do you guys read, see his movies much? Great filmmaker. So he makes the film Terminator 2. It's about an alien from another country who comes down, another world, and comes down to our world and gives up his life to save a woman and her child. He hates Christians. I've never heard him interviewed where he doesn't take a slam at Christians. The guy's obsessed. He's got something back there that's probably driving it. That's my guess. But what's the next movie he makes? Titanic. Spends more money on any movie ever made in history. $200 million. Made over a billion dollars on that. And how does it start out? There's a guy named Jack who doesn't even have a ticket to the doomed ship, and he wins a ticket in a poker game, and he goes immediately to the bow of the ship, makes the shape of the cross, and says, I'm king of the world, king of the doomed ship. There's a woman on the ship, and she's stuck in circumstances not of her own making. Um, her father has died. He's left the mother penniless. She's used to living a very high life. So she promises her daughter in marriage to a very wealthy guy who's like the devil himself. And this daughter is stuck in circumstances not of her own making, and she sees no way out 
The way that she is living is the way of death. She goes to the back of the ship. She's going to jump into the water. Jack just happens to be there and saves her life. They bring this woman back when they discover the Titanic. She's still old and still living. And they bring her back to hear the story of the night the ship sank. And she tells about Jack. And they say, wow, we have no record of him on the ship. And she goes, but isn't it interesting? He saved me in every way. And he gives up his life to save her. What's Cameron doing? He's going to make this movie $200 million. He builds a set a quarter the size of the original Titanic. He has incredible special effects. He gets big box office draws, gets Celine Dion to do the music at the height of her ascendancy. Everything, but he has to tell a story. And there's all kinds of people on the Titanic, a bunch of stories he could have told. He tells our story. And it's moving. What's the next movie he makes? Huh? Avatar. About a man who takes on the body of the people in this world and enters that world to save them. What does avatar mean in Sanskrit? Incarnation. Do you think he picked that name arbitrarily? He hates us. He keeps telling our story. Is he manipulative? Does he know that this is a story that always works? And we as apologists sometimes are so busy defending the faith that we move away from this particular story? Does he use it manipulatively because he knows that story always works? Or is he using it because even though he's been sad about some behavior of somebody in his life, in his past, he's still intrigued by the story? Now, if you go to the Disney movies, right? When my kids were little, they would have, let them see the Disney movie. And there's a Jungle Book. And so you've got Mowgli, the boy, who, who is uh, lost from his parents. And he's picked up by Baloo the bear and Bagheera the panther. And they raise him. And Shere Khan the tiger wants to kill the man-child. And there comes, after all the adventures, this moment towards the conclusion of the movie where Baloo sacrifices his own life to save him from the tiger. Bolt of lightning flashes, the tiger is only afraid of fire, he runs off, he's never heard of again. And Bagheera the panther and Mowgli the boy are walking away from the limp body of Baloo the bear, and they look back at their friend who's given his life up. And Bagheera the panther in the movie says, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friend. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like Rudyard Kipling to me. <laughs> and I break out my Rudyard Kipling, and sure enough, it's not in there. It's in John chapter 15. How did that get inserted in there? And you look at all these Disney movies that keep telling the fairy stories, and embedded in so many of those fairy motifs is the gospel. So, one time I was asked by the Disney people to come speak to the Disney artists. They bring in once a month some outside speaker to talk about the nature of story. Most of my academic work's on C.S. Lewis. So I was supposed to speak on C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien's vision of story. And when I came in, they said to me, listen, we know these guys are Christians. This isn't a place for you to proselytize. We know you probably can't divorce their Christianity from their theory of story. Where it comes in and it's necessary, that's okay, but leave it there. But if our artist asks you any question, you can ask, answer any question they ask. And I said, fine, I don't need to use it as a chance to preach the gospel. If I can get them interested in those authors, I could leave. They read the authors, they'll find Jesus. I don't want to destroy the opportunity and make an uh, obnoxiousness of myself. So I go in there, I tell the story, 45 minutes. They give them all a box lunch. They're sitting, 300 artists sitting in this tiered uh, room where they usually come in to draw and they have somebody up front, but now they give them a box lunch, they're sitting there, I give the lecture 45 minutes, 45 minutes of Q&A, first hand goes up. Um, wasn't C.S. Lewis a Christian? Could you tell us about that? <laughs> Next hand, wasn't it Tolkien who led C.S. Lewis to faith? Could you tell us about that? Next hand goes up. Isn't Aslan in the Narnian Chronicles a Christ figure? Could you tell us about that? Uh, next hand goes up. Uh, was Gandalf, when, when, when he dies, is Gandalf the Grey and comes back as Gandalf the White? Is there any suggestion of resurrection in that? <laughs> Every question for the next 45 minutes was like that. Whole Gospels presented the way they said would be legitimate, and the artists leave, and about 20 of the artists come up to me, and I recognize them. They're the ones that were asking the questions. 
They said to me, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah. Are you? They said, yeah, why do you think we were asking you the questions? <laughs> I said, okay, I have, a, I have a question for you. How come I find this stuff embedded in so many Disney films? Like John 15, greater love hath no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. And they said, oh, there's always been Christians here. And we've smuggled stuff into films for years. And then they said, of course, there are others here who have smuggled other things into films as well. That's a saw that cuts both ways. What is it about the story that intrigues us so much? And we need to get past the watchful dragons. And we need the checks and balances of authority, reason, and experience. Why? Because we're broken. We need those checks and balances because we have a tendency to manipulate, to rationalize, to self-justify, and so on. Uh, there, there, there's, there's a personal, not merely propositional, nature to the defense of the faith. There is the subjective and the objective, and they need to be in concert. And in our propositional apologetics, we can bring attention to the objective, but somehow we have to break through to the heart, the subjective as well. Um, reality is a non-negotiable, and yet we approach it with humility and wonder. And every truth, as I mentioned already, can be plumbed more deeply. And there's theological trajectories, and it's possible we could go wrong on some of those theological things. I don't know if you guys have ever done this as you're reading the Bible, where you see things like this. Moses gives revelation, and the revelation is um, uh, the property is going to be divided when we get into the promised land through the male heirs. Is that male priority? I don't know. The daughters of Zelophehad had come up, and they say, hey, this way, the way this thing's been, been given, we don't think it's fair. Because our father had all daughters. And the way this thing's configured, it's going to, instead of going to our father's legacy, this property right is going to go over to our cousins, our uncle's sons, and our father's legacy is going to be left out. And Moses is just given the revelation that comes through the male heirs. I don't know about you, but if I would have been around the daughters of Zelophead when they were challenging Moses on the revelation, I would have moved away from them because the ground was known to swallow <laughs> people up at that time. But Moses, to his credit, says, make your point. And they explain their problem. And Moses says, let me go back to God and ask. And God says, the daughters of Zelophe had a right. He gave the revelation, and he gave them opportunity to wrestle with the revelation and see further application that was consistent with the original revelation. So you get the book of Exodus, and then 40 years later you get the book of Deuteronomy. Same revelation, but it's nuanced a little further. What, what, what do we make of that? Is God up in heaven saying, oh, rats, I left this out, you know, shoot, I should have put this in. No, he gives them revelation and lets them wrestle with it, and then he gives them a second coordinate to set the trajectory of their thinking. And then what do you have after those two coordinates? You have the history of Israel. And we see in that particular coordinate the blessings when they did well and the trouble they had when they did poorly. We need checks and balances. We need a lot of things because we have a propensity to go wrong. He gives another coordinate later, the prophetic books that are corrective. He finally gives the greatest coordinate to trajectory of theological thought. That's Christ himself, the truth in shoe leather. And then what does he give? You know, how many people have you heard say, oh, if we could just get back to that first century church, you know, we'd be perfect and everything would be good. Walter Elwell, the theologian, said, I counted 150 places in the New Testament where the early church is corrected. And it's like looking for the noble savage or the noble first century church or the noble... No, we're broken. There's the correctives in the epistles. And then what? It ends. We've got all these coordinates for theological thought. And we still have new places to apply. This was given in an agrarian age. Does it have application in the industrial age or the technological age or whatever age comes next? And we can be rooted in these trajectories and begin to understand them better, but recognize that it's a process, and if it's a process done by fallen and broken people, finite in their understanding, then it's a process where we could sometimes go afoul. There's something embedded in the message itself that will help us there. So then uh, we've got presuppositional apologetics, We've got uh, worldviews we could present and so on, show how it works out. We've got evidential apologetics. We've even got arguments among apologists as to which is the right way to do it. 
why can't we have hybrids? Why can't we have many ways? Why can't we set, assess what the need is in the moment and out of our apologetic toolbox, use what we need at that particular moment? All of it should be personal. And then however we present our defenses and so on, we also recognize that um, we can have a, a, a tendency ourselves, even as apologists and as broken people, to goof up to not hear really what the need of the hour is. Again, continuing to argue when we don't realize there's maybe some deeply embedded psychological issue that needs to be addressed. Or maybe there's some brokenness because there's some bitterness that needs to be addressed. And moving in those directions. Basil Mitchell, the philosopher at Oxford University, he's actually my doctoral supervisor. I, w I think I drove him from education because I was his last student. So, he, he wrote a book called Faith and Criticism, and he said that, that it's hard, we can't really be neutral. We all have assumptions, and those assumptions can color our understanding of things. But he said we can achieve levels of impartiality. How do you do that? He says by giving the other person veto power over your understanding of their position. So it works in marriages. It should work for apologists. If my wife says this to me, and I hear this, because my grid's not always good. And any of you that are married know about this. And any of you that are married know that there should be something you should think about that that might help you as an apologist. So if Claudia says this, and I say, I think she says this, we talk like this. Three days later, I come back and I say, hey, Claudia, do you remember the other day when you said this to me? She said, I never said that to you. I said, Claudia, I was in the room, I heard you. Now it's a matter of integrity. <laughs> no, I never heard her. So Mitchell says, give her veto power. So I say, Claudia, is this what you meant? She says, heavens no, where did you get that idea? <laughs> now people, I'll come back to this in a second, we're all pea brains. We don't know very much. The Widener Library at Harvard has 19 million volumes under that one roof. Who's ever read them all? The Bodleian Library at Oxford University, 130 miles of shelf space. Fill out a reader's ticket, give it to them. They pride themselves that they could have the book for you within 24 hours. Who's read them all? We make judgments all the time we don't know very much. Any of us who have worked with atheists, we're, we're, we're weary of it because they're making a claim. There is no God. There's no possibility God exists. There's not one book in the Widener Library or in the Bodleian Library that would ever count against what I've claimed, even though they haven't read the books. If they're an academic and they're making this claim, they wouldn't give good marks to their, their students who are making claims about stuff they have to admit they don't know anything about. They're also saying nothing will ever be written. Who can make that claim? Give me an honest agnostic, my heavens. <laughs> so anyway, I want to make sure I'm hearing what's really going on. So Claudia says this, I say, Claudia, is this what you meant? She says, heavens, no. I say, well, you know what? I, I don't always get it right. She says, yeah, we proved that in this marriage several times. I say, give it to me again. She gives it to me again. I say, is this it? She says, that's better. I say, be patient with me one more time. And she gives it to me again, and now we're on the same page. I can articulate back to her what she knows to be so. And I say, you know what? That makes sense to me. Maybe the argument's over. Maybe not. But maybe now I can interject some helpful information. Claudia, that makes sense to me given A, B, and C, but were you aware of X, Y, and Z? She might say, uh, no, I wasn't. That's helpful to me. Or she might say, actually, I was aware of X, Y, and Z. Were you aware of L, M, N, O, and P? <laughs> it's good if I can hear what the person's saying so I can speak out of that theological trajectory and growing understanding what might be most helpful in that situation. And there's something embedded in the gospel that's more powerful. All the arguments are good. I like this stuff. I teach apologetics and stuff. I like it all. But, but there's something even more important that I don't want us to neglect. What is the goal of the apologist? It's defense of the faith. And it is the faith that is communicating the love and forgiveness of God. The overwhelming love and forgiveness of God. Can I take this uh, thing over here? And sometimes we forget how powerful the love of God is in getting past the watchful dragons. 
Mm. I remember once I was coming back from Slovakia, I'd been brought to Slava giving some lectures on C.S. Lewis. It was over spring break and I was in the Vienna airport getting ready to fly back to Wheaton. I got checked in, I got to the gate, and I found out my flight was delayed about three hours. And the people had dropped me off, they had already gone, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, this, this, this young woman with a lanyard around her neck and a name tag and a clipboard comes into the room, and, 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 and she starts going up to people, German-speaking city, she's asking people in German, looks like she's taking a survey. She goes to the next person speaking in German, I figure she's eventually gonna come to me. And she does, and she comes to me and she speaks in flawless English. And I'm going, what am I wearing that she addressed me in English rather than German, you know? And she tells me she's taking a survey for the airport. And I said, what's your name? She said, Allegra. I said, Allegra, are you from Vienna? No, I'm from Southern Austria. Oh, well, what brought you to Vienna? You can always ask public questions and don't go deeper than the person will allow, but listen to the answers and the answers will tell you where you can ask the next question. You get permission from that. And when, what's your name's a public question, she's gonna ask me questions. Where are you from? Are you from Vienna? No, I'm from Southern Austria. Oh, what brought you to Vienna? That's based on the information she gave. I'm a student, what's the next question? Where do you go to school? University of Vienna, what are you studying? Anthropology? Is the rest of your family still in Southern Austria? No, my father lives there, but he's a very bitter man because my mother left him to follow her lover to Canada. And my brother, he's up here at the University of uh, uh, Vienna, and we don't get along at all either. And everything as I went deeper and deeper, 20 minutes have gone by, she hasn't asked me one question on her <laughs> clipboard. <laughs> and I know also that she had a boyfriend who went to study art in Florence. And he said, wait for me, I'll be back in six months. And she waited dutifully for him. And he got back the day before I met Allegra just to announce to her that he met somebody better in Vienna. 20 minutes were at that point. And I said, Allegra, I know that you have to ask me questions, but I've been sent here to tell you something. And now all of a sudden, she thinks I'm a plant at the airport to see if she's doing her job right. And I said, no, no, it's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. But I have been sent here. Oh, people, remember, you have been sent. I've been sent here to tell you something. She goes through the survey quickly. How long will it take you to check in? How long will it take you to get through security? How long will it take you to X, Y, and Z? All the things you might expect. And then she says, what are you supposed to tell me? I said, Allegra. The God of the universe knows you, and he would never abandon you, like your mother, your father, your brother, your boyfriend. He loves you. I said it a second time to her, Allegra, he loves you. I said it a third time, because sometimes it takes three times to get through. I said, Allegra, he loves you, and she burst into tears and began sobbing, deep sobs. Everybody at the airport's looking over at her. And what's her response? But I've done so many bad things. Just like Isaiah, when he sees the holiness of God, nobody points out to him as a sinner. He comes in the presence of something God-like, and he unpackages. When people encounter the love of God that is ontological, right? Uh, it's essential to his being. God is love. It can't be improved by my well-doing or diminished by my poor doing. God is love. And she was undone by that. I don't know what would have happened if we had had some debate or some argument or something with all the pain in her life. Who knows how she might have covered that stuff up. But there was power in the message of the good news that we have not been abandoned by God. Now, I want to I unpackage this a little bit more. Um, C.S. Lewis said that in Mere Christianity, he thought pride was a great sin. He's not the only one to say that. Augustine said it in his commentary on Psalm 19. I disagree with them. So if I disagree with C.S. Lewis and Augustine, I'm probably wrong. But give me a chance to try and make a case for myself. And, and, and how many of you are, uh, would, would lean towards a reform position? You're somewhat Calvinistic. Okay, well, you guys will be more patient with me then because I was just rereading uh, Institutes last summer and, and Calvin has the same view I have, so I think I'm okay, all right? So basically this, when they say that they think pride is a great sin, they think it is the foundational sin upon which all other sins are built. 
or the main spring from which all other sins consolate. I'm not denying the fact that other sins could be generated by pride, but I'm not, con I'm not convinced it's the great sin or the axiomatic sin around which all other sins consolate. And if Lewis had said he thought pride was the great sin, like the apex of a pyramid is the greatest point on that pyramid, I could have signed on. But it would assume that there are things beneath pride that are far more substantive. Now, when I talk about pride, I'm not talking about um, uh, pride of a job well done. You put in a lot of effort to something, it comes out well. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the pride that you take when a friend of yours um, gets some good kudos and is encouraged. I'm talking about that form of pride that exhibits itself as pretense. This person has not circumcised their heart. What precedes that? Making ourselves look better than we are. I don't know what it is for you, but in my life, when I begin to see this emerge, what precedes it for me is fear or insecurity. If you knew me like I was, you might reject me. So I try and make things look better. Our evangelical subculture itself can engage in this sort of thing. We marginalize oftentimes the struggler. Words like out of fellowship, carnal, backslidden. What happens, though it's not explicitly stated, implied in that, is you better have your act together in this community. And if you don't have your act together, you don't want to talk about it because you saw what they did to the last guy. So consequently, how are you doing? I'm fine. And all of a sudden, our biblical proclamation from the pulpits, our apologetics, it begins to exhibit itself with this sort of pretense because we take it to the surface and we never get to the deep stuff that's embedded in the gospel message itself that we're loved and we need to be forgiven. Oh, but don't think that it's Christians who have a, 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 a corner on pretense. Watch one night of the news. I don't know how it is in your countries, but in America, you get these talking heads on the television and they'll be exposing some businessman who uh, absconded with all kinds of funds, or they'll have some Hollywood person who does some unsavory, horrible act, or they'll have some politician who's molested some kids or something like that. And, and they'll just expose people, constantly exposing people, and the talking heads act like they're above the fray, and you've got a whole culture that basically is living with these levels of pretense. It's something embedded in our fallenness to rationalize what's going on inside. And there's fear and insecurity. But what precedes fear and insecurity? And at this point, the scriptures will help us. 1 John 4, 18 says, Perfect love casts out fear. If perfect love casts out fear, the corollary would be imperfect love breeds anxiety. You and I have never been loved perfectly by another human being. Human love is great as far as it goes. But because we haven't been loved perfectly, all of us have been saddled with some burden of anxiety. And it gets worse before it gets better. We've never loved anybody perfectly either. So consequently, the people that look to us for affirmation and encouragement have also been saddled with the burden of anxiety. And it also means that there's a risk even when we do our apologetic work. We can pile it on and saddle people with the burden of anxiety. I think the great sin the really great sin is to live in neglect of the love of God. And when the love of God falls out of our apologetic and we become arrogant or we become um, uh, condescending or we become too harsh or we become insensitive or something like that, what's rooted in that? What, if, what, what are we forgetting about the value of, the, uh, of this great apologetic that at the heart of the gospel is a testimony to the love of God the reconciling love of God and his power to forgive. Now, let me see if I can give you an example of this, all right? I was on an airplane a while back, and I was watching a movie. This was quite a while back now, and, and it's hard for me to recommend a movie I see on an airplane because uh, uh, the movie um, might have been sanitized for the airplane. I remember one time I recommended a movie that I'd seen on an airplane. The person came back and said, how could you have recommended a movie like that? And they'd cut out this one particular scene, you know, so anyway. But the movie I saw, uh, it was a movie that in the midst of it on the plane, I caught myself in a moment beginning to sob. I'm a high T on the Myers-Briggs. I live in my head, and this doesn't usually happen. C.S. Lewis said, when you read a story, we could say, when you see a movie, get the story first before you analyze it. 
Don't analyze it while it's developing. Make sure you hear the message. And so I watched the movie, and there was this one place where I'm sobbing. I go back after the movie's over and say, why did that moment hit me so deeply? So what was the movie? It was The Notebook. Did any of you ever see The Notebook? You, usually if women are in the room, they laugh at me, right? Because it's a chick flick. And I just want you to know I feel secure enough in my, in my male identity, I can watch a chick flick, okay? But the movie starts out, how many of you have seen it? Okay, about half, all right. So the movie starts out where this this old man, and he comes to this nursing home, and he starts to read a story to this woman, and she's very standoffish, and the orderly has to say it's okay, he comes and reads stories every day, and, you, and the impression made is that this old man in his retirement comes to rest home, reads stories to people with dementia, what a nice guy, you know, and that sort of thing. And the whole movie is this old man, James Garner, plays a part, reads a story to this old woman, Gina Rollins, and the story that's a flashback. So it's present time and flashback through the whole movie. The flashback, Rachel McAdams plays a, a woman character, and Ryan Gosling plays a male character. It's their first big roles. And it's about this town set in, in, in the American South, uh, a region not too far from Charleston, South Carolina. And it's a lake, and there's this wealthy family that comes to uh, take vacation, summer there. So they're very wealthy that they could leave uh, everything and just stay in their cabin on the lake. And they have a daughter, and there's a young boy in that town. And, and there's so many things that count against this relationship ever working. But somehow a summer romance emerges, even though the, the young boy, he has a, an education, a high school diploma, and he even likes reading the, the poetry of Walt Whitman, but he has limited educational background. She has an education from the best schools her parents could afford. They're wealthy. He's of modest means. Their family is intact, though they're very pretentious. There's a mother, father, and a daughter. But, but his family, the mother's missing, and we never know quite why. Did she die? Did she abandon the family? And through the summer, with so many things that count against them ever connecting culturally and so on, they end up falling in love. And the, parent, the girl's parents are very much opposed to this, and they're pulling her out of the town, getting rid, rid of this, this boy, leaving him in the background, and he yells out, I will write to you every day, I love you. The mother hears this. And something else that accounts, uh, accounts against the relationship working. The mother, having heard that, goes to the mailbox and intercepts the letters every day. And the young woman says, he said he loved me, and he said he was going to write to me every day. I don't get anything. He writes to her dutifully, never hears back from her. And there's all kinds of sadness. Then World War II breaks out, and now the circumstance of situation and geography separates them further. And about this point in the movie, we see that with all these things counting against it, the relationship works out. And it's at that moment in the movie, the director tilts his hand, and we realize it's this old man reading the story to this old woman, and it's their story. And he comes every day to remind his wife of his deep, deep love for her. Towards the end of the movie, there's a, a nice dinner, tablecloth on the table. There's a candle burning. There's a rose in a bud vase, and there's a record player playing all the music that had informed so much of their developing relationship. And the whole environment is pulsating out to this woman, the love of this man for her. He finishes the story, and just as he finishes it, she says, that's the most beautiful love story I've ever heard, and it sounds so familiar. And in that moment, cognition washes across her face, and she says, it's our story, isn't it? And he says, yes. And she says, how much time do we have? He says, last time it was five minutes. She says, how are the children? That's a question a mother would ask, isn't it? They're fine. They came to see you today. Oh, please tell them. I love them. I will. And the music is playing, and she says, hold me. Can we dance? And they began dancing across that hospital floor. And just as quickly as she came into cognition, she fell out of cognition. And she finds herself in the arms of a stranger. And she starts screaming. And the orderlies come in and begin to sedate her. And James Garner's character is leaning against the wall, biting his knuckle, weeping. And that's when I lost it. 
And I wondered, why? Why did that scene hit me so so much? And as I thought on it, it dawned on me, this is all of our story. All of us are part of an incredible love story. And we live in an environment where everything pulses out to us, the love of the one who loves us. And even though there's so many things to count against it, there come those moments where we come into cognition and we're so overwhelmed. And then some little inconvenience occurs and we fall out of cognition as quickly as we came in. And when I saw James Garner's character biting his knuckle and weeping, I said, that's a window to the very heart of God who loves us so deeply and is constantly telling us. And what we're to do as apologists is, yeah, dismantle the scaffolding that people have built up in their rationalizations and so on, but dismantle the scaffolding and get to the heart and let them know that the great sin is rejecting or neglecting the love of God, but the love of God is unceasing. And it continues to come to us. Oh, it has different faces. If we're flat on our face, he won't abandon us. But neither will he let us stay there. And sometimes his love will reprove us and correct us. It will always pick us up, and it will nurture us and stay by us. When it says, God, uh, I I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you, Hebrews 13.5. It says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. There's five negatives there in the Greek. If you had a double negative in an English composition, I would have, I'd give back the paper to my students with enough red marks on it, it would look like it was bleeding to death. But no, in Greek you can have multiple negatives for emphasis. In, in essence it says, I will not, I will not leave you. I will not, I will not, I will not forsake you. It's with the passion of a weeping prophet we do our apologetic work because we want to get people back to the fundamental thing that they are deeply, deeply loved by God. I don't know one person who's lived one moment of honest life who doesn't long to be loved unconditionally. And we get to tell them about that. And sometimes we can be so engaged in the argument that we forget to get to this essential thing. And not only that, I don't know one person who's lived one moment of honest life who fails to understand that they need to be forgiven, that they are so deeply broken. Hopefully we're not forgetting it, My need for Jesus is not casual. It is constant. And my growing awareness each day as I grow, my growing awareness keeps me pressed to him. Spurgeon said, I've learned to kiss the wave that slaps me against the rock of ages. That self-awareness, that recognition of Baxter of Kidderminster, Richard Baxter, you know, he said, I'm a dying man preaching to dying men. And I get to proclaim the forgiveness of God. I, I, I'll sort of bring it to a conclusion with one, one last story because it's this issue of the love of God and the forgiveness. Do the apologetic work. Work hard. Read the books. Prepare yourself. God has called you to that. You're probably here because you're, you're, you're a thinker and you're bright and you are to be praised for that. God wired you for that. Do that work well. But the work is incomplete until you get people to the love of God and the forgiveness of God embedded in the message, which is compelling if people hear it. So here's the last story, and then we'll throw it open for Q&A. Every once in a while, you can be gathered together in a group, and somebody will say to you, uh, because you don't know all the people, and they say, well, let's have a little icebreaker here. Let's say your name and say something about yourself. You've been in those situations before. And every once in a while, they'll say to you, okay, tonight, let's just share our most embarrassing moment. Well, I don't know these people. Why do I want to undress my most embarrassing moment with these people? What are they thinking? But I remember whenever that would come up, what I used to say. I was in college, and I was going to take this young woman out on a date. I got to her home about five minutes early. She met me at the door and said she had a few more things to do. And she asked me to sit down in the living room. There was a wall that was recessed, and I'm sitting in the couch, and the couch was recessed back a little bit, and there was a, a hallway that went back this way to all the bedrooms and stuff, and the bathrooms. There was a hallway that came into the kitchen that was way back in this part of the house. There was a dining room there, and this was all the living room. And I'm sitting there, minding my own business. I did not ask for the circumstances that presented themselves to me. As the young woman's mother, apparently not knowing I was there, came walking into the room in her underwear, pulling on her girdle. 
I had been a physical education major in college, and I had never seen such kinetic activity in my life. And she's coming through like this, pulling on her girdle. I, I, I read Miss Manners, the etiquette columnist. And I've never read a column that tells you what the proper etiquette is to do when you see your girlfriend's mother coming into the room pulling on her girdle. So consequently, in that awkward moment, right, if you're not awkward someplace in your life, you're just not growing, well, this was a growth opportunity for me. I had to improvise. I put my hand in my head, and there was good reason for putting my hand in my head. I just sort of, uh, uh, uh. It is freeze frozen in my mind. I have tried many, many times to push the delete button. Is that woman is standing there mid stride, looking at me with this horrified look on her face for about five seconds, which gave new meaning to the word eternal. <laughs> and she screams bloody murder. And she runs out of the room. And Everybody in that house had to have heard the scream. Matter of fact, people in the neighborhood must have heard the scream. A few minutes later, the young woman comes out and acts like nothing happened. She never said a thing to me. I saw that mother several times later. She never said a thing to me. And you can bet I never brought it up again. And I used to say that was the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me. I, I don't say that anymore. I thought of another one that was worse. <laughs> you know what my most embarrassing moment was? 2,000 years ago, when somebody stretched himself across a cross. You want to know what my life's really like? It was necessary for him to do that for me. I have nothing to hide. There's no grounds for pretense. He loved me, and he forgave me. And if we can get people to that place, it is compelling. I'm done. Any questions? <laughs>